Hi, um, thank you all. Thank you, Dania, for Jay for hosting Nodes 2021, and thank you all for your interest in this talk. Um, my name is Elizabeth Mitchell, and I'm a senior analytics engineer at Tamer. Uh, Tamer is a Boston-based company which takes a machine, uh, human-in-the-loop machine learning approach to data mastering at scale. Um, okay. Perfect. Um, in this talk, I will be walking you through a problem that I have personally run across as a data scientist and an approach to solving this challenge. Uh, we're going to use a variety of open source libraries and platforms to address this challenge and reflect on the effectiveness of this approach, as well as any alternative methods for solving this problem. Um, so data classification is a term that I'm going to throw around a lot in this presentation. So I first wanted to clarify how I'll be using it in this context. Um, in the context of business intelligence in this presentation, classification can be thought of as synonymous with categorization or sorting each record into a category scheme, such as a taxonomy. Um, but this might beg the question, what is a taxonomy? Um, so a taxonomy is a hierarchical and systematic structure into which you can classify your data. So on the right, you can see an example of a taxonomy, and this one is of book genres, which will become relevant over the course of this presentation. Other examples of taxonomies used in real life are in science, the taxonomic rank of species under a kingdom phylum class, et cetera, and in the business setting, a taxonomy of indirect spend with categories like office spend or IT equipment. And there are a few core reasons why you might want to categorize or classify data. Um, and these will give cover, color to why taxonomies are so ubiquitous across the industry. Um, so categorization gives the data scientists the ability to sort their data at a category level, perhaps by importance in a business setting or alphabetically in an academic setting. It also allows you to retrieve subsets of the data easily by identifying a category or subcategory that can be used as a key for retrieval. You can also use the category for storage purposes, segmenting the data, as appropriate and preventing you from duplicating data across data stores um, or storing more than is necessary for a given purpose. Finally, the most important to me personally, categorization fuels analysis. Um, so one more real world example that's highly relevant to all of us right now is categorizing people into risk categories based on their risk factors. So these risk categories um, have been crucial to the implementation of the vaccine program. And at the core of them is really just data going through a classification engine. So now I'm gonna dive into a key challenge that arises when you're trying to use these aforementioned concepts. And this is what I aim to address with this project. So imagine you're a data scientist, which I'm sure a lot of you are. You have an original data set, and it's classified into a taxonomy. And you are required, um, you want to see what is in category A um, in both the first and second data sets. And in order to do that, you have to figure out which categories in your second data set correspond with category A in your first data set. So at a small scale, this might be feasible. And to find which multiple categories or category subsets might be appropriate. Um, but as the scale increases, uh, those one by one matches need more and more manual effort. And so if you want to run any analysis on the entirety of the two data sets, you would actually need to align their entire taxonomies into one unified taxonomy. Um, and you might consider a couple of ways of doing that to align them and to enable the traversal of the two data sets. So first you might consider just appending these two taxonomies. And this would assume that there's no overlap between them. So that's probably not true. And if you've got the same data type of data in the two data sets, it makes it even less likely. And you actually end up with one giant taxonomy with some duplicated categories. And you go to use them and realize that there are no categories with items from both data sets. And you're no better off than you started. So let's look at another option. Um, second, you might consider just mapping the two taxonomies together in a dictionary and you decide that you like your original taxonomy better than the taxonomy of the new data set. And so you decide to map taxonomy two into taxonomy one. And you start to try to decide what category from taxonomy two goes into which in taxonomy one. Um, and you realize you run into issues like that category two has multiple places in taxonomy one where you could draw a match. Um, and so using this method, you start to lose trust in your taxonomy map and lose the hierarchical structure of the taxonomy. 
Um, so you start to look for a better solution. Um, so you say to yourself, wouldn't it be great if there was one universal taxonomy which you could trust and which encapsulates the overarching ideas from both of the other two taxonomies? Um, it'd be great if it was one that people would know how to understand as a wrapper for your combined data set, and which might even be interoperable with other systems and automated processes. And if this was the case, you could perhaps just map each taxonomy into the ultimate best taxonomy, and perhaps you could come up with an algorithm to do that matching programmatically. And then if you acquire a third data set, you could just repeat the process and leverage the work that you've already done and use this best taxonomy as a source of truth across your data. So one solution for this universal taxonomy is an ontology. And an ontology can serve as a trusted source of truth in an industry um, as the standard of categorization on a particular subject. So the proposed solution is similar to option two that we discussed earlier, but rather than attempting to draw those direct links uh, between taxonomy A and B, uh, we're gonna link them to a central ontology, which allows us to have centralized hierarchical structure while not disturbing the disparate taxonomies themselves. So by maintaining a record of this mapping system, as new data points are added to each data set, they can be immediately mapped into the ontology-based data set and used in our analysis. So what is an ontology and what do they usually look like? Um, an ontology is a framework of common industry vocabulary, and it typically contains a taxonomic structure of entities as well as the relationships that may exist between entity types. So taxonomies are different than, um, they're different from ontologies in that a taxonomy contains only vertical relationships between tiers, uh, whereas an ontology contains those, those vertical relationships, but also horizontal ones between separate branches. And so a couple of examples in the life sciences sector are MEDRA and OAE, uh, which describe medical conditions and disorders and adverse events associated with clinical and drug trials. Um, while ontologies are most often thought of in the context of the life sciences space, there are ontologies in a much wider spectrum of use cases. Um, so I'll use the financial industry business ontology as an example to give a bit more clarity on what an ontology actually looks like. So the financial ind industry business ontology is a set of entities and relationships that are commonplace and understood in the financial business application. Um, it includes things like financial organizations, crime syndicates, business addresses, employees of the organizations. And it can be used in a variety of ways, and users often hook their data to the ontology in order to traverse the entities in their data set using automated systems. And this helps them also define the types of relationships that can be expected between defined entities. Um, using just the entity and subclass part of the ontology, however, we can actually extract a set of classes and subclasses defined in the ontology ecosystem, and then we can transform them into a structured taxonomy of entity types. So there are a few ways you can go about this, uh, but one of them is to extract the taxonomy uh, by ingesting the ontology into the graph database, such as Neo4j, and then programmatically retrieving each class and subclass until you've extracted the entire tree structure. Um, and that's the method that I will be using later in this presentation. Um, so here you can see a couple of examples of what this would look like in the context of the project I will outline in the next section. Um, we have two different taxonomies on the left and right, uh, which have components that can be matched and mapped to the ontology hierarchy structure. And once this map is built, we can traverse the data in the two data sets using the ontology. Um, so now I'll outline the tools and data sets that I use to demonstrate this method. So the first data set is in one of Amazon retail reviews. So this data set includes categorization of each product and one of those tier one categories is books. So I filtered down the data set to just the books, um, which provided about 700,000 book review records. And those are each divided into five or more tiers of categorization. Um, so as you can see here, this taxonomy is really structured and has a clear hierarchical structure. The second data set is one from Goodreads. So this one did not inherently contain categories for the books. Um, so I use the Open Library API to assign genres to the books using their ISBN number, which resulted in a much messier taxonomy without clear structure or hierarchy. 
Um, so these genres actually act a little bit more like tags than a taxonomy, and um, they've been manually assigned by humans rather than systematically derived. And so they contain much more fuzziness than those of the Amazon data set. Um, this suggests that we might see some differences between how the Goodreads and Amazon um, taxonomies uh, are structured with respect to how they will be mapped to the ontology. Um, and then finally, I identified an ontology to serve as the common point between these two data sets taxonomies. Um, so I'm using the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory's genre ontology, which among other things includes a taxonomy of written work genres. So just to go into a little bit more detail on this, this ontology has three different sections um, of resources or classes. And as demonstrated here, uh, what, as a demonstration of what those sections are and what they mean, um, an example book, World or History of World War II, would be categorized into three places in the ontology, the print medium, the collection form, and the historical genre. Um, while each of these sections has significance in different contexts, um, we'll only be using the genre part of the ontology. Um, so in order to, tr to transform this taxonomy into a usable format for my work in Python, I ingested the ontology into Neo4j using the Neosemantics plugin. Um, I then leveraged the Neo4j Python driver to iterate over the ontology and extract the ontology hierarchy. Now that we have all the components that we need, um, I'll try several methods for aligning each taxonomy to the ontology. Uh, the goal of this taxonomy alignment exercise is to develop a way to automatically map categories from each of the data sets, Amazon and Goodreads, into the ontology. And my plan for doing this is for each Amazon and Goodreads taxonomy category to consider all the possible places it could be mapped into the ontology and choose the best match. And I'll choose this match using some semantic matching algorithm metric, um, but the choice of which metric to use is still to be determined. So what's the point of doing this automatically? Um, in the case of the Goodreads taxonomy, there just are too many Goodreads categories to go through and map them all manually. Um, we could do this for a subset of the categories, but even if we were able to map the entire thing to the ontology manually, we would be constantly, um, when new books are added, being going through that manual tagging process um, and aligning them in different ways. And this would be a never ending process to keep up with if we don't develop some kind of automation mechanism. Uh, for the Amazon taxonomy, on the other hand, it doesn't really face this first issue of size as it's much smaller. However, developing an algorithm to automate it is still worthwhile for the purpose of maintaining the process without additional manual effort uh, being required over time. So in order to develop the mapping algorithm, we'll first build out the graph in Neo4j and each of the taxonomies and categorized books. Um, then we're going to develop an answer key, which we can compare the results of uh, different out mapping algorithms we try. Uh, we'll then vectorize the categories using a few different types of embeddings and compare the results to the answer key to determine which embedding to use. Um, finally, we're going to implement the mapping and visualize the results. Um, so building the graph, uh, I built the graph using a series of simple Cypher load CSV queries, an example of which you can see here. Um, the categories have unique identifiers on their category path, and the book nodes are identified by the titles, uh, which are then mapped to their corresponding category on the source data set. Here you can see the book node types under the two different types of categories from each source data set. Um, the Amazon taxonomy maintains its hierarchy with the subcategory of relationship, as does the ontology taxonomy. Building out the answer key was actually one of the most instructive parts of the alignment process. Um, from the taxonomy, I took a sample which was small enough to be manageable, but big enough to be generalized. Um, and for each Amazon genre and sample Goodreads genre, I was able to go through and consider what I uh, align what I considered to be a match in the ontology uh, taxonomy. And so the process taught me a couple of things. First of all, the ontology's vocabulary for genres was not immediately obvious. And I ended up Googling a lot of what the genres meant in order to build the key. Um, and this takeaway influenced my model metrics as I decided to try incorporating the titles of the books into the semantic matching model, as well as to leverage models trained on an external corpus. 
Um, so now that we've built out an answer key, we're going to test out three different types of metrics and see how well they do against our answer key in order to select which will be the baseline for our mapping algorithm. Um, so at a high level, these metrics use different types of context in order to create a vector embedding for each category, which we can then use to determine how similar the categories are. Uh, the similarity of categories will then be determined will then determine how we map them together. And so we'll start with a category semantic embedding using doc to back. Um, so doc to back is an extension of word to back, which derives a vector embedding for a document or a an ordered series of words. Um, so for this project, I used doc to back. Um, I used a model that was trained on a corpus of Wikipedia articles. And that model leveraged the distributed bag of words algorithm, uh, which generates vectors by guessing their context words from the target word. Um, so to leverage doc to vec on the category titles, I first split up all the words uh, in the category name and clean them by eliminating punctuation, lemmatizing, stemming, and lowercasing all the words in the document. Um, I then fed these documents through the doc to vec model trained on the corpus of Wikipedia articles to derive the embedded, embedding vectors. Um, and then I was able to load these vector embeddings into Neo4j as properties of their corresponding category nodes. Um, in order to determine how similar two, two categories are, I needed a semantic, a similarity metric in Neo4j. Uh, and graph data science has several different types of similarity metrics. But I chose cosine similarity for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, it takes duplicates into account. And second of all, in my experience, it's the most widely understood similarity function and should therefore behave in the most expected way. So let's look at an example of what this actually means for our project. Um, so we've assigned category semantic embeddings to each node. And uh, this means that we can now determine how similar two nodes are. And so since our goal is to map each Amazon and Goodreads category into an ontology category, we'll start with a single Amazon category and explore what this metrics tells us are the most similar ontology categories, i.e. where the best, pro best pro probable uh, correct mapping would be. Um, so I've selected education and reference as an example Amazon category. And here you can see the ontology mapping possibilities in ranked order of how similar they are to education and reference based on their embeddings. Um, and at the top of the list is reference work genre. And these embeddings were derived from the names of the categories. So it makes sense that the most similar category would have an exact word match. Um, moving down the list, we can see social sciences, pedagogical, historical, and scholarly genres. And each of these has a pretty, is a pretty good match, um, if perhaps at a lower level of granularity from our target Amazon category. However, uh, we can also understand why this why it would be making these suggestions based on our Dr. Beck model, as we would expect to see these terms come up frequently in similar contexts on Wikipedia to education and reference. Um, so now let's look at an example from Goodreads. Um, once again, we picked a single category from the taxonomy and are looking at that the ranked options for the ontology mappings. So this time we've picked English language and history from the Goodreads taxonomy and we're looking at the ontology possibilities. Um, so at the top of the list, we see poetic within the literary genre, which seems like a decent match. Um, surprisingly, this category match achieved a higher cosine similarity than historic genre, um, despite the STEM word history occurring in both of the category names. Um, and so we can guess that this probably occurs because the title of the Goodreads category is a more diverse document with history occurring within the context of English language rather than by itself. Um, so from these examples, we can preliminarily conclude that the category embeddings led to decent matches with rather high cosine similarities between pairs in general. Um, and this metric does emphasize the exact words contained in the category title, and so could theoretically presume a, high, a higher co cosine similarity between titles with word overlap, um, but where that word means different things in different contexts. So for example, if our two categories were science fiction and political science, we might hypothesize that this metric could give them a high cosine similarity because the word science occurs in both category names, although it means different things in the two contexts. However, this didn't really seem to be the case in our Goodreads example, as we saw. And so perhaps we can preliminarily conclude that the Wikipedia training is able to account for that. Now let's look at embedding book titles and using that for contextual semantic matching. 
Um, so to use Doc2Doc on the book titles, I once again had to split up all the words in the book title into a document, and I removed the punctuation and capitalization as well. And so I ran these documents through the model to derive embeddings just as before. But this time, uh, we're attempting to leverage the document or book title as context in the matching process um, to further reveal what the categories truly are and mean. Um, however, this all depends on the hypothesis that you can imply category meaning based on the titles of books that are in the category. So I first wanted to test this hypothesis before moving forward. So the question that we're asking here is whether you can presume the meaning of a category from the title of a book. Um, for example, from the book title, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, um, can you tell that this is in the fantasy genre? And if so, can you tell something more about the fantasy genre than we could before knowing that Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix was classified as fantasy? Um, we would then know that fantasy includes topics such as phoenixes, and for that matter, chambers of secrets and sorcerer's stones. And if this is the case more often than not, then perhaps we can embed all of the book titles and look at them in aggregate uh, to give category nodes some more context. Um, and so in order to test this hypothesis, I looked at a subset of embeddings of books in three different categories to see if I could logically discern which category a book was in based on its embedding. Um, and by graphing the book embeddings in two dimensions and coloring them based on the category they're in, we can test whether the embeddings of books within a category are more similar to one another than to the embeddings of books in other categories. Um, and as you can see, it would actually be possible to make an educated guess of which category a book belongs to based on its title embedding. Um, and this supports our hypothesis that book titles do have some semantic tie to the category they are classified into. And so we'll continue to analyze this metric. Um, so I again loaded the embeddings into Neo4j's properties, um, just with the category name, just like with the category name embeddings. Um, as you can see from the screenshot, these embeddings are quite large properties. Um, and given that I added them, uh, an embedding to every single book in the database, I actually expected to see some performance deterioration, uh, but it actually maintained really high query speeds throughout the project. Um, so once I had an embedding in Neo4j for each book title, I needed to aggregate these as a, at a category node level. Um, and so I took the meaning of the embedding, the mean of the embeddings of all of the books and uh, filed within a category and then assigned that as a property to the category node itself. So finally, I compared the same Amazon category to the ontology categories using the book title mean rather than the embedding based on the category name. And so as you can see, these matches are less dependent on the actual words in the name of the category. Um, and that's a result of them being based on the book titles instead. And so for example, whereas the top match using category semantics um, included the word reference. Reference word genre isn't even in the top 10 matches when using the book title matching. Um, and the cosine similarities are pretty high across the board, which signifies that the books categorized as education and reference in the Amazon data set are pretty semantically similar to the words in the names of the ontology categories. Um, so for example, a few books that are categorized as education and reference in the Amazon data set are workbook and laboratory manual and physiology 5e. Um, and so we see here that these titles are pretty similar to the names of the ontology categories across the board. And this could be because the books in this category are typically textbooks. And so their titles are much more subject oriented than those in the other categories might be. And so the extent to which they are similar to a given ontology category does not seem quite as indicative of how similar categories are as we might have hoped. Um, narrative genre is an okay match, but it seems like there are better categories, which could have been better uh, mapping suggestions from the algorithm. Uh, when we look at the Goodreads example, we can see that it has relatively low cosine similarity values across the board. And these matches seem not to be quite as good as they were in the, the Amazon example um, using the category name embeddings. Um, so from this, we can discern that overall, there was uh, not as much semantic sim semantically similar between the titles of the books in the English language and the history um, Goodreads category and the ontology category set. And uh, that where similarity did exist, it was not as indicative of true similarity of meaning between the two categories. So overall, the book semantic matching um, had decent matches within the Amazon data set, and it had lower similarity scores between matches that we know to be correct 
Um, there was also generally less similar between the book title embeddings and the ontology category embeddings. And so perhaps there was just too much diversity of book titling to draw as good of con conclusions as we were able to from the category semantic metric. Finally, we'll explore a totally different metric type using node to vec. Um, you can probably tell from its name, but node to vec is an embedding algorithm that delivers a vector embedding of a node, and it derives this by using a series of random walks or uh, graph traversal simulations of the graph from a given node. Um, and you can use various controls over how the algorithm works, such as the number of iterations and the number and length of walks, uh, as well to determine the length of the returned embedding. So after testing a few different combinations of the aforementioned variables, I settled on what you can see here um, and determine the embedding of each category node using information in its hierarchy. So here we start to see less probable matches. Um, the highest match for education and reference is poetic genre, which is not impossible, but it does seem like there are better matches from what we've seen from the other two embeddings. Um, here, too, we see some more improbable matches. So the top match religious, religious genre definitely is not the correct mapping for English language and history. And the node to vec model seems to think that this is actually a pretty good match at 65% cosine similarity. So based on our preliminary findings, we can assess that the node to vec model is giving us unreliable matches uh, with relatively low cosine similarities in this scenario. But why is that? So in order to dig into why we might not be getting highly accurate matches out of node to vec, um, we first must consider how node to vec determines its embeddings. So embeddings are based on a series of random walks or graph traversals, as we discussed before. Um, this means it's quite dependent on the structure of the graph and probably performs best with high graph complexity and structural significance. Our graph, however, is relatively simple with only a few relationship types and highly disconnected segments of the graph. Um, we're going to use the answer key um, to test out how well the different embedding types do in a more quantitative way um, so we can decide which embedding to use for the full mapping exercise. Um, so we'll do this for both the Amazon and Goodreads data sets to ensure that we capture if there's a difference between the embeddings, which embeddings work best for each source data set. Um, for each node that is, a, that is a correct match based on the answer key, we'll calculate the cosine similarity of the match and average this over the entire data set. We'll then pick the metric which has the highest cosine similarity average um, to the correct matches. And then we'll use that metric to carry out um, the rest of the matching exercise. Um, so based on this method, we can determine that mean book embeddings give the best matches for the Amazon data set, whereas path embeddings give the best matches for Goodreads. And so this could be for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, the Goodreads data set had more fuzziness and length in the category names, and so it just had more built-in context um, just by leveraging the path. And the Amazon data set, however, typically only had one or two words in the name of the category, so incorporating book titles gave the model a lot more to run with. Um, second, there were more books uh, in each Amazon category than there were in each Goodreads category, and so there were less outlier books in the Amazon data set within each category based on uh, exploring a sample. Um, so then I use the Python driver to run the cipher queries to carry out the matching. So now let's see the results of the process. Here you can see a few examples where the model agreed with the answer key um, and with the Amazon category mappings. And as you can see, both religious, religion specific categories were mapped to the religious genre um, and education and reference when it's the reference for a genre, as we would expect based on our analysis. A few examples of the model agreeing with the Goodreads answer key are shown here as well. Um, so despite increased fuzziness of the Goodreads um, category names, these matches are aligned with what we manually decided was the correct match, uh, which gives us more confidence in the matching model. While comparing to the answer key is, is a good exercise, it's also important for us to look at the larger ecosystem of matches uh, that were drawn. So here we can see the categories which match with journalistic genre. And I would consider this genre to be a bit of a mixed bag in terms of how well things were mapped into it. 
Um, some of the mappings are great and obviously correct, like journalism, sports broadcasting, but others like gymnastic and bowling are obviously incorrect. Uh, one possible reason could be um, that there is not an ontology category, which is a more obvious match. Uh, religious genre, on the other hand, um, contains much higher quality matches, such as worship, holidays, church history, etc. And this could be because religion is a more well-defined space with a larger number of obvious matches in both taxonomies. And finally, let's explore where books themselves ended up in the taxonomy. So here we can see two scenarios where the same book can be found both in the Goodreads and Amazon data set. And on the left, the same version of Harry Potter was mapped into two places, the Goodreads version into a fictional genre and the Amazon version into literary fiction genre. And both of these can be deemed correct. Um, even though they're a little bit inconsistent. And on the right, a short history of nearly everything, um, although in different categories in its source data set was put into the same ontology category. Finally, let's reflect on a few key takeaways and learnings. So first, graph-based embeddings such as node to vec require more complex graph structures and provide significant value to similarity, in order to provide significant value to similarity algorithms. Um, second, semantic metrics such as these uh, explored in this presentation do not work better than manual alignment and should be used to augment manual processes rather than to replace them. Um, finally, some categories had a wider variety of nonsensical matches, which could, which could be indicative of an inaccurate model training or inconsistencies in the training corpus. Um, over the course of this project, I considered several alternative methods for matching categories, which are worth mentioning as well. So first, training the doc to vec model on a different corpus, such as a, a library database, um, could have improved the accuracy. Um, there were also many more things that I could have incorporated into the documents being vectorized, such as the book descriptions, Amazon reviews, and more tagged fields in the Goodreads data set. Um, finally, we can consider using an automated machine learning algorithm, or else a machine learning classification approach um, from a vendor in the machine learning space. And thank you all for your attention. I'll pass it back over.